Now to the Gulf oil spill. Officials with BP and the subcontractors are set to stand trial for one of the worst environmental disasters in U.S. history, one that could ultimately cost those companies tens of billions of dollars. But a judge has just delayed the civil trial by a week. You'll recall the explosion at the oil rig off the coast there killed 11 people, injured more than a dozen more, unleashed some 200 million gallons of oil in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2010, forced the feds to temporarily close thousands of square miles of the Gulf, severely hurt the fishing industry. It was the backbone of the Gulf economy. Now the trial's on hold and the case may never go to court as tens of thousands of people and businesses work it to hammer out a settlement with the companies behind the spill. And if you see the commercials for the green symbol on the left, you would think that the place is better. Thanks for the fact that they spilt 200 million gallons of oil. Those commercials, I know you've seen them. Come to Mississippi, come to Alabama, come to Florida. We're open for business. No thanks to anyone on that screen, and that's a fact. The judge is here. Judge Andrew Napolitano is here. Delays, not surprised. Well, the government uh, <clears throat> has already supervised the distribution of six and a half billion dollars yep. to 586,000 individuals and businesses. When those individuals and businesses took their share, received their share of that money, they gave up their right to sue. Who is remaining to sue? Another 12 thousand businesses and individuals represented by 340 law firms are all consolidated in one case before one judge who's going to try the case at one time. The case was scheduled to begin this morning. Last night the judge said, I just heard some um, happy news from the lawyers in this case. We're going to put the trial off for a week. It may be settled. So you have <clears throat> $30 billion in a kitty. Uh -huh. For the lawyers for BP and the lawyers for everybody else who had anything to do with the construction, operation, or maintenance of that rig to distribute to 340 uh, law firms presided over by a federal judge who himself is a former plaintiff's lawyer. And he thinks that this is a good sign and it's optimistic. A good sign means the case will be settled, people can get their checks and go home and go on with their lives. A bad sign means they start a trial that will take a year to try without a jury, with just a judge deciding whose fault all of this is and who's entitled to the big bucks. Right, we have a statement from BP, which I'm going to translate now. Uh oh. The record development proceeding in this proceeding leads directly to the conclusion that no single action person or party was the sole cause of the blowout. That is, you know what? That and a dollar ninety-three will get you Starbucks. Hey, Shep, to say that one right. entity was not a sole right. cause means also they all screwed up I, and they all ruined parts of that Gulf. And no matter what the commercial says, that is a fact. As we speak, three hundred and forty lawyers are in a room somewhere in Louisiana trying to settle the case. Issuing a statement like that, it's not our fault, but it's the fault of all sorts of other people who may be at this table and who may not be at this table, is not going to move the ball forward. So I would suggest to you that that statement was released for tactical purposes as a, as a brushback pitch to the plaintiff's lawyers in that room, judge, at that table. Judge, isn't it be the attorneys who end up with all the money? Hello! Ding, 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 ding. The lady from the Business Network wins the grand prize. Door one, two, or three. You can have all of them because that is the fact. Say it again. I think that the attorneys are going to walk home with the loot. They're going to get a tremendous amount of money. The amount they get is regulated by court rules, but it is an enormous amount of money. There are 340 plaintiff's lawyers in here. There were a thousand of them. They competed for the right yeah. to uh, represent their clients in this case. You tell the mom and pop grocery store owner in past Christian or you, or you tell the small motel owner in Biloxi Gulfport, or you tell the folks down in Bay St. Louis or along Waveland where they're still trying to clean up from that hurricane that ruined their lives, that this BP oil spill is all fixed now. The lawyers have gotten a room. See the commercials. Come on down. We're open for business. Nothing has changed, and they all screwed up, and they all know it, and the lawyers are going to get rich, and that's a fact. BP is going to drop a lot of money. They've well, dropped six, hope they six drop billion a lot of money. already, and they've put aside, according to their regulatory I know filings, a lot of good thirty billion. Well, I know a lot of good folks on that Gulf Coast who would like to drop something on some BP. <laughs> and they'd like to drop. <laughs> Only it you can this. say it that way. <laughs> well, I know them, and they've said it, and it's the truth. Because they, they you, you, people in the rest of the country, are like, oh, I'm tired of hearing of the Gulf Coast. You know, there's a hurricane, boom, they're flattened. Oh, there's a oil spill, and oh, the commercial makes it seem it is not fine. It's not fine.
you don't lose two years of livelihood and expect about how are you going to put your kids through college? That's one interesting it's, thing about this case is the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs are innocent. Yeah. There's no charge against them. No charge. I'm running out of time, and I'm sorry, Gulf Coast. We can't fix it. Welcome back. Is the White House taking a heavy-handed approach at cracking down on the media? There seems to be a disconnect here. You want aggressive journalism abroad. You just don't want it in the United States. Well, I would hesitate. Whoa. That exchange last week was between ABC News reporter Jake Tapper and White House Press Secretary Jay Carney. And it's raising more questions about the Obama administration and something called the Espionage Act. Here now with more is Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning, Steve. Steve, Steve good morning. All right. So uh, they were talking there in the White House briefing room about the journalists who were killed over in the Mideast. Right. And, and uh, you know, the White House had saluted them. And then Jake Tapper says, wait a minute, the people who are doing uh, significant journalism in, uh, or as, he refer, as they refer to it, aggressive journalism in this country are being cracked down on. The administration, even though when President Obama was Senator Obama, he attacked the Bush administration for lacking in transparency. This administration has been attacking journalists and people who speak to them because of transparency. Uh, example. Last week in a federal court in Baltimore, a federal district court judge threw out an indictment against a guy named Drake, Thomas Drake, a, a former NSA staffer, right. because he talked to the newspaper about a matter that was already in the public domain. But the administration got so angry at him for talking about things they didn't want talked about to a reporter that they indicted him. And a federal right. judge lambasted the administration for doing that. So Jake Tapper says to the, says to the White House press secretary, right. How can you praise some reporters but not others? You're only praising right. those you agree with and not those that expose you. Exactly right. And there is a picture of Jake Tapper, the correspondent at the White House. Now, uh, this, this particular espionage thing has only been used a fraction of times in American history. But this president has used, I think, has doubled the total number ever used in history. Well, no one has been convicted yet under this act in, in this administration. But just charging them with that is chilling. It's basically charging people for attempting to convey truthful information to reporters, information the government doesn't want out there, information that's not always a secret, even though the government calls it a secret. That's what happened in the Drake case. Right. We're talking about which computer system was better for the government to use and which vendor was right. overcharging. That is not secret classified information, but the government called it as such and indicted the person who talked about it and the court threw out the indictment. Once upon a time, reporters had the, uh, you know, had the ability to protect their sources. They said, you know, we'll back you up, but you don't have to worry about us revealing you. There is no federal shield law today. Unfortunately, there isn't, and that's why the, uh, the government right. is going after these people, and it shouldn't. All right. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, we thank you very much. Pleasure, Stevie. A big story that's getting national attention now. New York City's police commissioner is defending a counterterrorism program that keeps tabs in a few different ways on the Muslim community here in the city. Police are conducting undercover surveillance at mosques, at businesses, at college campuses throughout the region. And critics are calling this operation profiling. They're saying it's a fishing expedition. And most importantly, they're saying it's illegal. But police commissioner Ray Kelly says the tactics are necessary, they're legal, and what he's trying to do is uncover possible terrorist attacks. Take a listen. We're going to continue to do what we have to do to, uh, to uh, make certain that, uh, to the best of our ability, that we don't have another uh, catastrophic event like we had in 2001. Judge Andrew Napolitano is Fox News senior judicial analyst. The commissioner says our memories are short. We're pandering right. to politics. There's been 14 plots that he can talk about that have been foiled because of operations like this. Is it legal, though? Well, the commissioner, who is a fine person and a great enforcer of the law, took an oath to uphold the Constitution. And the Constitution says that the police can't do anything unless they have articulable suspicion to pursue someone or probable cause to believe that they committed a crime. Stated differently, the police cannot surveil or profile or monitor someone without a belief that that human being has committed a crime. And they can't decide who to monitor people on the basis of a religious group to which people belong. But we, That's well established in our law and in our history. But if we do know, and we have had different events that have been tied to different mosques around the area. If we do know that in the past, a place like a mosque has been used 
to rile up radical Muslims. Maybe not all the people that are attending it are, are that way, but there's one or two. Then isn't that enough to say, listen, we got to take a special focus on this community? No, he can go to a judge and get a search warrant. He can tell the judge what it is about these people that causes him to believe that they are likely to commit a crime and that gives him the right to spy on them. Without that buffer zone between the urge of the police to use spying to keep the rest of us safe and our natural rights. Without that buffer zone in the hands of a judge, the police could spy on anyone for any reason they wanted and use we're going to keep you safe as a basis for it. Interesting. Congressman Chu out in California agrees, along with Senator Menendez out of New Jersey, who's calling on the Justice Department to investigate. There's been calls for the state attorney general of New York to investigate as well. But the state attorney general says because of unexplained legal and investigative obstacles, they will not investigate. Well, the state attorney general would have a difficult time investigating crimes that took place in New Jersey by FBI or CIA or NYPD. The CIA and the NYPD have no authority to do anything in New Jersey. Now the public officials in New Jersey are saying, well, wait a minute, we knew they were here, but we didn't know they were doing that. Hmm. So someone's going to have to uh, investigate this, otherwise it, there will be nothing someone, stopping it. Is someone the Justice Department? The Justice Department or the Attorney General of New Jersey can investigate what happened. This has only happened in the past four or five years. This is not ancient history. And according to Commissioner Kelly, and his heart, Commissioner Kelly's heart is certainly in the right place. They're going to keep doing this. Well, speaking of, you know, recent history, made us think about an event that happened last year. We had it live on our program, in fact. You probably will remember this. It was one of the largest or the largest roundup of organized crime ever in this country. Right. And the attorney general was out in front. We do know the stereotypes about organized crime. I'm half Italian. I believe you're Italian as well, Napolitano. <laughs> and that is a community that obviously had been targeted because of, quote, the organized crime that was happening amongst it. So what's the difference? Okay, the Constitution makes it very clear. The government cannot target groups, no matter whether you are born into the group, like Italian-American, or whether you choose to join the group, like the Mafia. It can only target individuals, and it can only target individuals as to whom it has a belief that they have committed a crime. And it can only do that after a judge authorizes it. Where is all that? In the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Why is it there? To protect us from the government getting so strong and so intrusive that we don't have our freedoms anymore. And so it's a conversation that begs a longer conversation, which I'm sure we'll have in the hall. Uh, it soon. would be my pleasure to discuss you, anything with you, We have you, the John. question about whether the law protects or whether the law allows things to happen that we want to not happen. I don't know, Judge. Thanks, Judge. Anytime. Appreciate it. Anytime. Some newly released 911 calls now from this Ohio shooting. They are chilling. 17 year old TJ Lane accused of killing three students, and now we're hearing the fears of those who watched it. I currently have a group of students with me outside of the college. Okay. Did you see the shooter? Are you a student? Yes, I'm a student. I was right by the shooter when he pulled the gun. What was his beef with these kids? Do we know? I have no idea. It's a kid that uh, um, generally, like, I try to talk to. He's, like, he's very quiet, and he doesn't really talk to anyone. Age 17, should he be tried as an adult? Judge Anna Napolitano, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst, with me now. And, sir, good morning to you, Judge. Hey, Bill. You've seen these cases when you're sitting on the bench in New Jersey. Right. He's 17. Does he fit? Well, Ohio's rule is different from most of the other uh, 49 states. In most of the states, if a person commits a serious violent crime at age 16 or 17, the state, the prosecution, has to persuade a judge why that person should be tried as an adult. Ohio has turned that around and says if you are 16 or 17 and you commit a violent crime with a firearm, the burden is on the defendant to show why he should not be tried as an adult. Stated differently, this guy will be tried as an adult because he fits all the requirements for the automatic mm -hmm. trial as an adult. I remember as a, as a younger man, as a younger you reporter remember those days? in Ohio <laughs> when, when the law was changed. Yes. And the reason it was changed is because of the violence that they were seeing among teenagers. And because a teenager and an adult can commit the same crime at the same time and the adult can get 30 years in jail and the teenager can get 18 months in jail and the good people of Ohio said 
enough is enough. So this law, which has not caught on in other states yet, mm -hmm. was changed in Ohio. So that, the, the burden of proof is on the juvenile to say why he should be tried as right. a juvenile, he would not as an adult. Right. He would have to demonstrate to a judge that this was some sort of an aberration or an accident or, or the result of extraordinary mental uh, immaturity, and that doesn't appear to be the I case. Two here. distinctions here. He cannot be, you argue, tried for first-degree murder. Why not? Well, if what we now know turns out to be the case, that is, he didn't go in there intending to kill a specific human being, but just to kill someone, that would make this second-degree murder. First-degree murder is the planning and plotting and targeting of a specific so person. So right now, based on what we know, we think it was random, the targets he chose in that cafeteria. Yes, we could learn more information as, as the police do their work and do their investigation, but on the basis of what they've now revealed, it appears as though it was random. Second issue, this is what the prosecutor said just yesterday. This is a person who's not well. On, on the outside, you would assume that to be the case. But is the prosecutor suggesting the state of mind of this 17-year-old? That would Perhaps be, is not fit for trial? This is the prosecutor now. It would be very unusual for the prosecutor to say that. That would suggest to me that his unwellness, if you don't uh, object to that word, is so apparent that they may try and have him uh, committed for the mentally, uh, in, in an institution for the mentally insane. He would stay there until he is sane, which could be six months or six years or 60 mm -hmm. years, depending upon the definition of, uh, of sanity. In the meantime, you, you listen to some of these parents who have lost their kid. And it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a heartbreaker. Heart no bad. death penalty under any circumstances because he was under 18 at the time these events occurred. And the Supreme Court has prohibited of the death penalty in those circumstances. Point taken. Thank you, Judge. Pleasure, Bill. All, right. All right. To the Supreme Smackdown, uh, the House just voted to overturn a Supreme Court decision on a case involving evident domain. Now, the 2005 ruling gave state and local governments the right to seize private property, let's say like your home, for someone else's economic development use. No word from the Senate on whether we'll even take this up to the judge on why, well, he thinks it should and fast. Hey, Judge. Well, this, this is an abominable Supreme Court decision. It's a, it's a 2005 decision called KELO, K-E-L-O, and it basically says that a government can condemn property and pay fair market value for it against the wishes of the owner and then sell it to a developer and make the profit. And that profit that it makes on selling the property goes into the government's coffers, the government treasury, and that's a public benefit which is acceptable. So it's basically saying the government can take property from anybody it wants and sell it to somebody else, even if that somebody else isn't going to use it for a public use. The Constitution... So it has a wide definition. ...has a very wide definition of governmental benefit. The Constitution uses the phrase public use, meaning if the government has to build a road or a library or a post office, it can take the property so that the public can use it in its new iteration. Supreme Court changed that and said as long as more money comes into the government treasury, they can take that property. The House of Representatives had a, has passed a bill which would prohibit states from doing that. The vote was by a voice vote, but it was overwhelming. And as many liberal Democrats as conservative Republicans supported it. Question, what will the Senate do and what will the president do? Are they interested in preserving people's property rights or don't they care? Um, for a lot of wormy politicians, it could be a dicey call of the ethics here. But, but for the Senate, is it a simple majority? Well, it would be a simple majority to pass it. If President Obama signs it, it's the law. If President Obama vetoes it, then it would require two-thirds of the Do we know the, the president's view on that? president has been mysteriously silent on it. The Democrats and the Senate have been mysteriously silent on it because the vote in the House was so overwhelming with huge numbers of Democrats as well as Republicans. Neil, we don't know the numbers because they did it by voice vote. But from those who were in the chamber when the voice vote was taken, there was nary a peep to say nay. Everybody said Said yay. So, so that would overwhelm All right, that would imply the same reaction in the Senate. One would hope so, because this particular uh, Supreme Court decision has unleashed those who think the government has a higher right to your property than you do to seize it from people for no discernible public use. Can I ask you a dumb question? And you're very patient with my many. Um, how often is a Supreme Court decision reversed? Almost never, if you'll forgive that odd uh, phrase. It's almost impossible for the Congress to reverse a Supreme Court decision. So what the Congress is doing here is not saying the decision is no good. It's just saying to the states, if you do this, if you follow what the Supreme Court has done, we're going to let people sue you for it. And that will be a deterrent to the states from doing it.
Amazing. Or so it is hoped. Now I understand, as I always do after you come up here. What a One pleasure. minute with the judge and the most complicated legal <laughs> issues. He's like one of those Apple pamphlets for a very complicated product. <laughs> He's the pamphlet. He's the guy. Thank, Thank you, you, Judge, very much. Thank you, Neil. Meantime, a federal judge has decided against a government rule that would have required tobacco companies put large and, frankly, graphic health warnings on cigarette packages. Some examples of the labels in question, they show here diseased lungs, obviously, and a body with chest staples on an autopsy table. Back in 2009, Congress passed a law ordering the FDA to adopt the new labeling rules. They were supposed to go into effect this year, but yesterday a judge sided with tobacco companies and ruled the labels violate free speech rights under the Constitution. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is with us. You know, Judge, they have these kinds of pictures in other countries. I've seen some of them in, in Europe and beyond, but you wondered if this was going to go through, and apparently, at least for now, it's not. Well, here's the thing. Look, the First Amendment applies to individuals and it applies to corporations. But the, the courts have allowed the government to regulate too. commercial speech, speech of corporations that's intended to induce people to buy the product. What's the linchpin of that regulation? The linchpin of that regulation is some evidence to support the regulation grounded in truth. So, for example, when the FDA required the cigarette manufacturers to post a label saying, the Surgeon General has determined that smoking is dangerous to your health and that of your children. That is a truthful statement. It is dangerous to your health, and the Surgeon General has made that determination. But when the FDA decides to put pictures of autopsies on cigarette packages, there is no conclusion that smoking automatically leads to death and to an autopsy. Therefore, the court said the FDA can't get away with it because it's interfering with the otherwise free speech rights of the cigarette manufacturers. Major setback for I've the government, under Shep. Yeah, I've never understood from the beginning this because, as far as I know, cigarettes are the only product which, when used exactly as directed, kill. And, and why it is, I'm not saying they should make them illegal, but, but why it is that they're, I, I just don't understand it. There's a very simple reason why the government won't make them illegal. It's called money. The government collects yeah. state and federal 50 billion, with a B, dollars a year in taxes on the purchase of tobacco products. And the government doesn't want to lose uh, that tax revenue, even though it costs the government more than 50 billion a year in health uh, payments for people who are harmed by uh, the use of the products. Well, more changes are coming, guaranteed. Time, time will tell. Judge yes, Napolitano, good to see you. Thank good you. Good to see you, Chef. The accused school shooter in Chardon, Ohio, has been charged as a juvenile. If he is convicted on juvenile charges only, uh, the Ohio 17-year-old could spend only a matter of a couple of years in juvenile detention. He faces two counts of attempted aggravated murder and one count of felonious assault, in addition to three counts of murder as a juvenile. These juvenile counts of aggravated murder and attempted aggravated murder would meet only a few years in detention if he's convicted. But the prosecutor has already said he plans to try the boy as an adult. That could mean life in prison if he's found guilty. So what are we to make of this? It sounds like these are the first charges. Now there's a process which will go on. Let's bring in uh, the criminal defense attorney Randy Zellin, who's live back in our, in our New York studios. Randy, this is a beginning, but it means a certain series of, of steps will now be taken. Yes, it is a, a fascinating, really Solomon-like decision because you have the seriousness of the charges, yet you have the benefits for T.J. Lane, the defendant here, being treated as a juvenile. The judge now has the ability to, to conduct a number of hearings, a hearing on his mental capacity, his state of mind, whether or not he understands that what he did was wrong, whether he has some diminished capacity. We've heard a lot about what this kid has gone through as far as his, as far as his childhood. Then there's something called an amenability hearing, which is exactly what it sounds like. Can can this child be rehabilitated? The judge can hold a hearing to determine whether or not he is a continued threat to the community, whether he's a danger, whether, whether or not he poses a safety issue. Judge Napolitano, Andrew Napolitano, our senior judicial analyst, is with us as well. And, Judge, this is, this is not the end of the charges. This could very well be just the beginning. Th this is just the beginning, and as Randy has just so nicely articulated, it's an unusual beginning, and it tells us a couple of things. It tells us that the government itself 
has serious questions about the mental stability of this young man, that the government itself is hesitant about charging him as an adult because, as Randy articulated, when you are 16 or 17 in Ohio and the charge is aggravated murder, you are presumed to be an adult. It is your burden to prove that you are not an adult and should be tried as a child. The other states, it's the other way around. You're presumed to be a child, you're tried as a juvenile, and the government must prove that you should be tried as an, as an adult. So this prosecutor, perhaps a very candid and intellectually honest uh, gentleman who articulated himself after reading the interviews that the police conducted with the boy, we have some grave concerns about his mental stability, is obviously taking those concerns into account by the manner in which he has commenced this prosecution. R Randy, uh, th there's more to come, but what would you anticipate happening next? Would we get a lot of information about what happens in these, in these juvenile hearings, or would that be the sort of thing that a judge does in camera away from all of us? Because he's being treated as a juvenile, it's all going to be confidential. We will know nothing. All right. Uh, judge, it, w when, would, when would it be your guess that we would hear about adult charges? You probably want to hold, if you're the judge in this case, you want to hold these hearings as soon as the government is ready to hold them. That would mean as soon as um, psychiatric exams have been taken on the young man and as soon as the government has gathered all the evidence that it needs to prosecute the case. This judge now has a very profound, almost as Randy says, Solomon-like decision on his hand. Which is better for society and which is better for this child? That he be tried as a child and rehabilitated or he be tried as an adult and punished for the rest of his life. It will take months, Shep, to answer your question before all of that information has been assembled and can be presented to the judge in a secret but orderly fashion. You, you know what you're saying is this town is in for a very long and difficult struggle ahead. Yes. I'll never forget what Littleton went through and, 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 and now this town's ready, is getting, about, about to get it. Yes, you're right. No, no, no instant guilty plea and end of the process. Rather, the beginning of a long, tortuous, and hopefully fair process for the town and for the boy. Well, we can certainly hope so. We'll have continuing coverage of this throughout the afternoon. We'll get analysis tonight on the Fox Report, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 o'clock Central. Randy Zellin, uh, Judge Napolitano, thank you both. Welcome back, everyone. Google pressing ahead with a new privacy policy despite the controversy surrounding it. The agreement allows the web giant to track users' personal data to develop targeted advertising. So if this sounds like an invasion of privacy, you're not alone. So does the policy comply or circumvent the FTC regulations? Let's ask Judge Andrew DiPolitano, the senior judicial analyst here with Fox News. Judge, this bother you? It, it doesn't bother me, and I'll tell you why. Uh, this is a private company keeping track of the use of its facilities by its customers and then tailoring products that it offers to the needs of those customers. Sort of like if you go to your bank ATM every Friday and you're borrowing money from the ATM and uh, a week later you get an email from the loan department of the bank saying, would you like a loan so that you don't have to keep um, uh, making the, uh, these small borrowings. Google is not selling this information to anybody else. They're keeping track of who uses their services and then they're trying to tailor products that they offer to the people uh, who use them. That's one side. Okay. The other side is, why do they need to keep a record of everything that we do? And is the existence of that record dangerous? Could someone get their hands on it? And then the third side is, if you don't like this, don't use Google. Okay. Use another search engine that doesn't keep these records. All right, so this only affects people who actually have Gmail email That's accounts. correct. That's a good point. Yeah, so, so if, if I go search on Google, are, are they tracking my data? No. Only if you use your own Google Gmail account, are they okay. keeping uh, records of that? We believe. Now, of course, I haven't seen their internal workings, but that's what they told the Federal Trade Commission they would do in a, in a consent decree that they entered into back around Thanksgiving. But in the fine print of this privacy agreement, right. does it say anywhere that in the future they can sell this information to a third party? It you know? says that in the future they can only sell it to a third party with the permission of the person whose information is being sold. So you would log onto your Gmail account and they'll say, do you want the sold to a third party? Click no, they can't. Click yes, they can. Right. That's probably what's coming next. But the agreement requires they get your permission to sell your private uh, information as to how you use their engine. Right. Uh, here's what Google says. Uh, their quote, our updated pri privacy policy will make our privacy practices easier to understand and it reflects our desire to create a seamless experience for our signed in users. I would add one word to that. Our <laughs> updated invasion of privacy policy. <laughs>
policy. But it's not the only company doing this. Well, there, there are, there are, I, th I think you're probably... No, when you go to the drugstore and use one of those cards, they're tracking your, what you buy, too. Correct. I think you're probably right, but it is the only large computer server that the FTC went after. Interesting. All right, Judge, have a fantastic Oh, weekend. you too, guys. Always right. a pleasure. Happy Friday. Thanks. New developments tonight in the Obama administration's assault on religious freedom with the so-called contraception mandate. Senate Democrats earlier today defeated an amendment that would have allowed employers to opt out of providing contraceptive, uh, contraception coverage if they uh, have either religious or moral objections. Republicans, religious leaders, say that this is just another attack on religious liberty. Democrats say the proposal could threaten access to care. Joining me now with his view on the Conscience Act, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Hello. Judge, I, this is, how do you style this? Well, you know, it's a contraceptive uh, mandate, a contraception mandate, uh, or, or an assault on religious freedom, uh, or, or a, a women's health care issue, depending on how it's spun. What do you I, think? I was personally furious when the president issued these regulations, which basically said to religious institutions, you have to violate your conscience or you have to uh, violate the law. I was equally as furious when the Senate today basically said to the American people, we're not going to let you follow the conscience on something as intimate as contraception. We're not talking about speed limits. We're not talking about public safety. We're not talking about national security. We're talking about an intimate decision between spouses and often the physician. That should be none of the government's business. Well, it's going to be, in the, it is the government's business now in court as well. Uh, seven attorneys general filing suit against the mandate right. Right. Uh, led by uh, uh, attorneys uh, general uh, Alan Wilson uh, and, uh, and John Bruning in Nebraska, Greg Abbott in Texas. Uh, they are going after this issue uh, hard and they mean to stop it. What are their chances? Well, regrettably for the legal process, the president, and maybe he did this intentionally, Lou, didn't announce these regulations until after the Supreme Court agreed to review the constitutionality of the statute. That means that this aspect does not go before the Supreme Court when they have oral argument later this month. By this aspect, I mean the the order to Catholic institutions that you have to make contraception available. The contraception mandate is right. subordinate to the individual mandate yes. for the Supreme Court. Yes. That's if, the way a country boy would say it. Right? The country boy said it perfectly. If, if the Supreme Court invalidates the individual mandate, I think, and you probably agree with me, the whole statute will fall because without requiring people to have health insurance, there won't be enough cash in the system to generate all its other uh, regulations. The government will take the position that the Supreme Court has only invalidated the portion that it invalidates, and it can still order employers to make uh, contraception materials available, whether it violates their conscience or not. And, and that, then tactically, it's a good thing for the public interest that these attorneys general have filed suit because if that if the unthinkable were to occur, that suit will then still have uh, vitality, merit, standing. Uh, yes, yes. This is a very clear cut issue. The government has never assaulted in America, has never assaulted core religious beliefs like it's doing with this contraception mandate. It's almost inconceivable that the government could prevail on this. We appreciate it as always, Judge. My pleasure, Thank you. Lou. Judge Andrew Napolitano.